Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. In our last episode of The Bad Batch, we once again revisit the world of Ryloth, home of the Twi'lek people. These are a species that have constantly been oppressed by their neighbors and larger galactic powers. And in The Bad Batch, we once again see this planet in the beginning of another cycle of servitude and exploitation. Today I want to take a more complete look at the history of Ryloth and the Twilight People and try to understand why they're so vulnerable to foreign occupation. Now, Disney canon doesn't really know much about the origins of the Twi'leks, and so we once again have to dive into the expanded universe and legendary content. And until any Disney canon directly contradicts that legend's material, it's probably the closest we're going to get to the truth for a pretty long time. Now, long ago before the Empire and even the Republic existed, there was a terrifying species known as the Rakata. They were a primitive and extremely violent race of aliens that naturally had a dark side affinity and had taken over much of the known galaxy, destroying the old precursor races and enslaving all of the younger races, including humanity. For almost 10,000 years, the Rakatan Infinite Empire reigned. But then suddenly, a mysterious plague hit the Rakata that began to strip them from the Force. This wasn't only spiritually devastating, it was also an existential crisis for the Rakata. You see, all of their technology, from their spaceships to their weapons, were powered by the Force. Without the Force, the Rakan Empire would fall apart within generations. All of their planets would lose contact with one another, and the Rakatans would regress back to the savage species they evolved from. In Legends, it says that the Twi'leks were actually a synthetic race created by the Rakatans as part of an experiment designed to save their own connection to the Force. This would have happened around 25,200 BBY. However, there were also reports of advanced Twi'lek civilizations on Ryloth as early as 36,453 BBY. This is when the Thor Yor starships arrived on the planet and took several Force mystics from Ryloth to Tython, where the ancient Jedi would be formed. So even in Legends, we don't know exactly when the Twi'leks came into existence, but what we do know is that in 10,000 BBY, the Galactic Republic would rediscover Ryloth and invite the Twi'leks to join their government. Twi'lek society was relatively fragmented. Most Twi'leks lived in small clans that were scattered across the planet, and it would remain like this for thousands of years. Their home planet of Ryloth was rugged and full of extreme weather events and extremely dangerous fauna, like the terrifying lilacs, a gigantic predatory insect that also happens to travel in giant swarms. They're basically the arachnids from Starship Trooper. The Twi'leks, because of a lack of resources and technology, mostly sheltered themselves in the sides of mountains and in caves in order to survive their rugged landscape. This kept their population centers very small and their numbers quite low. And so when Ryloth joined the Republic, they were completely unprepared for interacting with the rest of the galaxy. Being in the Outer Rim and a relatively young planet, the Twi'leks were mostly ignored by the central government. But soon, rich deposits of real spice were found on the world, and that started attracting the attention of outsiders. The local Twi'lek leaders were unable to scale up their operations because they lacked the capital and knowledge to do so. Soon cartels and corporations began exploiting the planet and eventually the huts would take over a good portion of the mining operations on Ryloth. The Twi'leks were more or less enslaved by the huts and they were exported all across the galaxy for profit, which is why today there are so many Twi'leks everywhere you go. Finally, in 3643, the Twi'leks were able to kick the huts off of their planet and regain control of their own sovereignty. But the new Twi'lek leaders who were in charge would continue to exploit their own people, especially women, and sell them off into slavery. Now, the Clone Wars is where the canon version of Ryloth history starts. The separate strategy in the beginning of the war was to target Outer Rim planets that had either no affiliation or very loose affiliation with the Republic. The planet of Ryloth was only a part of the Republic by name. They didn't really receive any benefits or protection from the core worlds or judicial forces. And so when Watan Bor of the Confederacy of Independent Systems launched an invasion and blockade of the planet, the Separatists were able to quickly wipe out the small Republic garrison stationed there. The Republic unit under the command of Jedi General Ima Gundy and clone Captain Keeley managed to hold out against the Separatists long enough to allow the local Twi'lek resistance to flee into hiding. Amongst them was the revolutionary Cham Syndulla. 
The entire Republic garrison was destroyed, but Champ Syndulla and his fighters would survive and wait in the Ryloth wastelands for the promised Republic counter-invasion. Meanwhile, Wat Tambor and his droid army would occupy the city of Lesu, and his forces would pillage villages in the surrounding areas and rob the locals of anything in value. The Republic, as promised, would return later on in the war with a gigantic fleet. After destroying the Cypress blockade under the command of Captain Murtuk, the Galactic Republic would launch a multi-pronged ground assault against Separatist defenses with the goal of retaking the capital of Lesu. Now, somewhere along the way, the Champs and Dueler's resistance fighters would join Mace Windu and his 91st Mobile Reconnaissance Corps and spearhead the assault on the capital. Watanbor was captured and his forces completely destroyed. The Republic would stay on Ryloth even after the battle was won. The Republic garrison would maintain a vigilant watch for another Separatist invasion for the rest of the war. Although there was suspicion amongst the ranks of Champs and Duelist fighters about the true purposes of the clones, their heroic sacrifices on behalf of the Toilet people during the Clone Wars made their presence much more tolerable. When the Clone Wars officially ended in 19 BBY and the Republic turns into the Empire, Ryloth actually becomes an Imperial Protectorate. The planet was considered free and independent, but in reality, the clone Imperial forces' presence on the planet said otherwise. There was also the disarmament of the local resistance fighters that also pointed to more sinister intentions on the Empire's behalf. And one needed to look no further than at the mining facilities the Empire was constructing all across the planet to understand what they were really after. By 14 BBY, the local Twilight government had been replaced by an Imperial Moth who oversaw the entire system. The Twi'leks were essentially turned into a slave labor force. The women were sent to become dancers and servants for Imperial officers, and the men were sent to the newly created real mines. The cycle had repeated and the Twi'leks once again found themselves in shackles. And Sham Sandula, who had been driven into resistance once again, reorganized the Free Ryloth movement. That same year, the Emperor and Darth Vader would visit Ryloth for inspections. It was during this time that Sham Sandula would carry out the most audacious assassination attempt on the Emperor. Using a massive force of Clone Wars era droid starfighters, Sham Sandula and his fighters were able to destroy the Emperor's transport, an Imperial class star destroyer known as the Perilous. This forced the Emperor and Vader to escape onto the surface of Ryloth, where they had to survive on foot for several days while being pursued by Twilight Resistance fighters and the monstrous local floor. This assassination attempt would ultimately fail, but it shows us just how capable the Free Ryloth movement was. Sham Sandula and his fighters would continue to use asymmetrical warfare to resist the local Imperial occupation, and finally, in 5 ABY, the Empire would abandon the planet and Ryloth would regain their independence. Rebel Alliance fighter pilot Yendor would become the first ambassador to the New Republic on behalf of the Twi'leks. Although the Ryloth was thankful for the actions of the Rebel Alliance during the Galactic Civil War, they opted out joining the New Republic. The Twi'leks learned not to depend on some large galactic government for their defense. They realized that they needed to create their own defense force and their own stable political structure to remain independent. It was probably a good idea that Ryloth never pledged allegiance to the New Republic because like the sequel trilogy, it was soon forgotten. After a giant Death Star, I mean, sorry, Star Killer base blew up the New Republic capital of Hosnian Prime. Princess Senator General Organa and her small ragtag resistance fleet was in great trouble and on the run from the First Order in the beginning of the war. The soldiers needed a place to refuel and regroup themselves, but most worlds were either already under First Order occupation or terrified of the repercussions of helping the resistance. Now, Ryloth officially was neutral in the First Order Resistance War because they didn't want to get involved, but Leia had some friends from the Rebellion period on the planet and they would basically shelter her. Ambassador Yendor was Leia's contact, and he would pass the resistance into the hands of the Ryloth Defense Authority, the spiritual successor of Champs and Duelist Free Ryloth Movement. This was a paramilitary force that remained independent from the Leisu central government, and it was designed to always be prepared for struggle and resistance should the need arise. So there you have it guys, that is the complete history of Ryloth and the Twi'lek people. As you can see, it took them quite a long time to figure out how to defend themselves, but once they do during the First Order and Resistance War, it actually puts them in a much better place than they were during the Galactic Civil War and the Clone Wars. Well guys, let me know in the comment section below what you think about the Twi'leks and their history. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. 
As usual, thanks for joining us today. And if you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.